So hello everyone. Um, when I was thinking about uh, today's uh, lecture structure, I wanted to do it a bit more, let's say, casual in sense that I would like you to be involved in, in a certain way. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me or ask questions or give a comment or whatever, because I think that it, it would be more interesting. Um, I will speak about several concepts and case studies that I found interesting for today's topic that are not necessarily uh, direct, directly connected to each other, but I thought that uh, they're all important or useful to be mentioned when speaking about urban living rooms. Um, so the title of my intervention today is Spatial Coziness, something that I came up with um, when I was preparing uh, an article with my colleague philosopher uh, on the topic of place and happiness. Um, so this is something that sounds, it seems uh, obvious, but uh, if we think about it, it's actually uh, a bit taken for granted. And uh, there are no so many uh, scientific researchers uh, on it and works. And yes, by the way, my name is Sanya Iguman. <laughs> And I am a research fellow at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Um, so the concepts behind the placemaking uh, originate in the 1960s, let's say, when writers like Jane Jacobs and William White offered groundbreaking theories and ideas about designing cities for people. Um, their work focused on the importance of lively neighborhoods and inviting public spaces. Jacobs advocated citizen ownership of streets through the now famous idea of eyes on the street. Uh, White emphasized the essential elements for creating social life in public spaces. I guess that you all know what, what this is uh, if you're from Belgrade or living in Belgrade, right? On the, on the photo. I'm, I, I'm asking you. <laughs> Do you know what this is on the photo? No. Okay. So this is a uh, uh, Ulichna Galleria or uh, street gallery, uh, which is um, uh, it, it was an empty, abandoned space in uh, Bezistan uh, next to Dom Sindicata, which is um, a theater hall, cinema hall. And uh, some years ago, Sarah, what, do you know, maybe more or less, like 10 years ago? Yeah, it was the anniversary uh, this year, I think, and they celebrated 10 years that uh, um, uh, a group of uh, enthusiasts in uh, Ministry of Space, the Association Ministry of Space, um, decided to, let's say, to, to uh, reorganize that uh, hideous, empty, dirty, abandoned uh, space and to make a street gallery, actually. And now for the 10 years, um, they're organizing uh, exhibitions, uh, performances and events. And uh, it's uh, quite a popular place, both for uh, local and for international artists. Uh, so yeah, maybe you can have a look on, on, the, on the, the web and see a little bit about it. Uh, we have already heard a lot about how to design cities good for the physical health, but not that much about the mental health. Thanks to material that has been produced so far, we can see that there is enormous potential to improve individual and population mental health through specific urban design. This doesn't mean, of course, that architects and urban planners have not paid enough attention on creating and producing beautiful places for living so far just means that there haven't been that many researches on the connection between urban design and mental health. And there should be because we should create cities and places that are good for our physical health, but that are also impact on our state of mind, happiness, coziness, and finally well-being and a good mental health. This is particularly important if we take into consideration that according to UN research, by 2050, almost 70% of people on the planet will be living in cities. Also something that most of us can presume, people who live in urban areas are more likely to have mental disorders compared to those living in rural areas. In order to deal with this topic, with this 
relation between mental health and, and, uh, and cities, a multidisciplinary approach and efforts are needed. So exp experts that come from different areas, such as architecture, urban planning, sociology, anthropology, geography, ecology, psychology, philosophy, etc., are immediately called upon. Also, the way we perceive uh, places uh, is so sort of stratified because we experience places through our senses. The way we ordinarily see the world is not the way it really is because we see it from the perspective of our judgments and preferences, our likes and dislikes, our fears and our ideas of how things should be. Sensation and perception are two separate processes that are very closely related. So sensation is an input about the physical world obtained by our sensory receptors and perception is the process by which the brain selects, organizes and interprets these sensations. In other words, senses are the psychological basis of perception. Perception of the same senses may vary from one person to another because each person's brain interprets stimuli differently based on that individual's learning, memory, emotions, expectations, context where he or she lives in, and so on. 80% of the sensory information that brain receives comes from our eyes, much more than from any other sense. Commonly listed alongside vision as one of the most important of the human senses is hearing, a vital part of everything from communication to risk avoidance. Um, senses rely on different sensory organs, but are very closely related. So when someone loses his or her sense of smell, for example, their sense of taste is dramatically diminished. But there are other senses that are somehow neglected in uh, urban planning, in, uh, for instance, uh, creating tourist destinations where you can see that uh, everything is devoted more, more or less to, not everything, but most of it, to, to the vision, to the sight. But uh, touch, smell, and other senses are somehow neglected. So the sense of touch is remarkably complex and involves the detection of everything from pressure to itchiness to temperature. Most of these sensations and their mechanisms remain poorly understood, but are thought to involve a range of nerves in the skin capable of responding to various forms of stimuli. While our sensory receptors are constantly collecting information from the environment that, around us, it is ultimately how we interpret that information that affects how we interact with the world. Perception refers to the way sensory information is organized, interpreted, and consciously experienced. Perception involves both bottom-up and top-down processing. Bottom-up processing refers to the fact that perceptions are built from the sensory input. On the other hand, top-down processing is how we interpret those sensations influenced by our available knowledge, our experiences, and our thoughts. Key ways in which urban design can help improve mental health which is also paying attention to these um, sensations that I just mentioned, to all senses, including smell, vision, touch, uh, hearing, and so on, uh, are various from uh, creating green spaces and access to nature, active spaces for exercise, pro-social places to encourage positive social interaction, um, providing safety in the city, sleep, transportation, connection, economic stress and affordability, uh, affordability uh, which is, sorry, minimizing economic stress and, and um, uh, rising the affordability in the city, uh, taking care of the air pollution and so on. Um, now, something that, uh, that came up uh, two and a half years ago, which completely uh, shook up the whole planet in, in all senses was uh, the COVID pandemics, of course, that exposed the fragile socioeconomic and spatial structures of our cities. This has posed a new question about the search for solutions capable of transforming models of urban economic growth and development as a result of rethinking the management of services, production and work activities with particular focus on their spatial configuration. One important effect at the spatial level is the increasing importance of open public spaces or open air activities where it is easier to develop strategies to assure a realization in safer conditions. Public gardens and parks, public urban spaces like squares or pedestrian roads will be the new backdrop of the future of cult or cultural and artistic initiatives for living, but also for tourism. Uh, where per perception of space is concerned by reducing general mobility and co-presence in public or private spaces to limit contagion back then, 
uh, hopefully not anymore, uh, we witnessed a direct environmental impact in decreasing air and acoustic pollution produced by private or public mobility, thus revealing a new perception of our place of living. We all remember those images with the uh, swans in the Venetian canals or uh, happy dolphins, cats, birds, uh, uh, once they uh, actually took over uh, the environment once we were closed in our homes. The beauty of certain decrowded natural urban landscapes revealed a new image and sound of our cities and territories where the material landscape is more visible than before and the soundscape is revealing living beings and things before unperceived, like birds, water courses, distant trains, and so on. Um, this is the image from uh, Bergamo, which was one of the, maybe the one, the heaviest uh, uh, destination that was hit by COVID-19 in uh, 2020. And uh, they had uh, one of the most severe uh, lockdowns in, in Europe. Um, and after that first uh, wave, let's say, in uh, May 2020, I think, they decided that uh, uh, they will um, work on their public spaces since uh, they were really traumatized and they, they had uh, strict bans on um, spending time in closed spaces together and so on. So uh, what happened in, in Bergamo is that uh, the city government uh, allowed uh, all owners of um, bakeries, uh, gelaterie, cafes, restaurants to uh, occupy the public space uh, without any uh, cost so that people can spend as much as possible time outside. And this was also working during the winter because Italians are not afraid of the winter. They, they stay in, uh, in uh, gardens of the, of the cafes and restaurants with those uh, uh, heaters. Um, so this is the example of uh, one of the very busy uh, streets, Via Brosetta, uh, which is, as you can see, uh, uh, the tables and chairs of two restaurants have taken over the whole uh, lane because at 7 p.m. they, they were closing uh, the public transportation for that uh, part of the street, and not only public, actually also for cars, because uh, uh, it was supposed to be uh, given to these uh, uh, restaurants and, and the bars um, as a sort of promoting to stay outdoor. And this lasted for two years. And also they worked a lot on, on these ideas of spending time in, in parks, in uh, these public areas, so avoiding completely staying indoor. Um, on the other hand, however, the disease produced a separation because we perceived an unreal landscape emptied of people, tourists and city users that we did not experience ever before in our globalized world. And we miss their actions, movements and activities. We should therefore in the future focus on the diversity of our landscapes and consider them as strengths from which we should start. So speaking about landscape, um, an important concept when speaking about the interaction between humans and nature in space is the creation of places, landscapes. Um, Bonade in her Paisaggio con Figure provides an interesting perspective on landscape, saying that people individually or as a group conduct a series of procedures while transforming the world into a landscape, measuring, segmenting, and setting up fun uh, functional relations. In this sense, the subjective image of a landscape is being delivered from the eyes to hands and written on the ground of a certain cultural society. This way, a landscape is dominated by optical and political metaphors, a concept articulated by uh, British sociologist uh, John Uri in his famous argument, there is no innocent gaze. Uh, he spoke mostly about tourism, about uh, foreign gaze. That means someone who is in mobility, traveling to a certain place uh, uh, that he or she doesn't know with the gaze that is absolutely individual and not innocent. Because for instance, each of us here will have a different gaze on, I don't know, Budapest, because of our educational background, social background, our expectations, experiences, and so on. Um, in addition, Bonade uh, cites Berger, who claims that people see only what they look at, while looking is a matter of choice. 
People never see only the object of looking, but the object in relation to themselves. When we see a landscape, we situate ourselves in it. In other words, the observer becomes observed to a certain extent, that way creating an individual context between him, her, and the landscape. Um, Darwin connects space, time, and social actions in relation to landscape. He claims that these are necessary elements for powerful landscape in the present, which may be seen also in its past, mostly through archaeology. For him, landscape is time dependent, spatially referenced, socially constituted template or perspective in the world that is held in common by individuals and groups, and which is applied in a variety of ways to the domain in which they find themselves. As a key concept for understanding the relation between humans and nature, Landscape is difficult to define. It, it refuses to be disciplined. In recent years, landscape gained the characteristic of a text that can be read. Some scholars even mention a conversation with landscape, explaining that it can speak, speak to us. Because of this, a strict dichotomy be between human, actually cultural, and natural is avoided and softened. Um, so one of the definitions, of many definitions, is given by Ingold, so I, I cite. Uh, landscape is a multi-layered concept. It includes nature in the meaning of earth, water, plant, and animal life, biological and geological diversity. It includes human-made objects, buildings, roads, sculptures, the products of culture. It also includes movements and action. But on top of all these visible phenomena, landscape includes the invisible the invisible relationship which emerge in people's actions, movements, speech, thoughts, imaginations, and narratives are intertwined within the visual. They emerge in an interaction with the visual. So if we speak about landscape and uh, its relation with the city governance, see, every government practically leaves visible and invisible marks on the city, actually landscape, according to their politics. However, these visible marks usually stay forever and change the city's appearance. As we can see on the image, but also uh, in our everyday life, the current Serbian government is changing the area of the Belgrade confluence by massive projects that might change its form and meaning forever. I mean, not only the Belgrade confluence, but this is the, 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 mo the most powerful example, let's say. This confirms the notion that the representation of landscape is never detached from politics, but very much embedded in a sense of power. Landscapes are created or destroyed within a certain ideological context and linked to a particular place and time. Serbia does not have a proper law that recognizes and protects landscape as a concept. Although Serbia signed and ratified the European Landscape Convention from 2011, that way joining other 38 European countries and committing to protection, management, and planning for the landscape. The European Landscape Convention was adopted in Florence in 2000 and ratified, uh, as I said, 11 years later. The convention is supposed to be applied to the entire territory of each country, that is, to natural, rural, and urban, and suburban areas. It implies mainland, mainland uh, its waters and seaside areas, and can be applied to the areas that are labeled and considered exquisite, as well as ordinary and degraded. Uh, as we can see from uh, many uh, examples all around the city, not only city, also Serbia, of course, um, some of the landscapes, uh, famous uh, symbolic uh, images of Belgrade uh, are permanently uh, destroyed. If, if you take an example of a uh, Ka district uh, close to Belgrade Fortress Kalemegdan, then the idea of uh, gondola, cable car, uh, Belgrade waterfront that completely, I mean, just take a look through the window, uh, completely changed. Uh, the Vizura, the sky, um, sky, um, skyline, the skyline, uh, both from the river and uh, the other side. 
but I mean, this is only in, in terms of, well, if I speak about landscape, there are many other problems. For instance, Belgrade waterfront and these buildings created a microclimate uh, because the, the, the air flow from the rivers cannot reach the other parts of the city as they used to because these uh, tall and uh, closed buildings are blocking it. Um, Another concept or topic that I would like to tackle uh, refers to spaces and their transition into places. An interesting theory about the spaces given by Perich, who understands the process of mutual transformations of meaning between space and the events that take place in its uh, uh, kind of drama dramaturgy. This process establishes an ephemeral chronotope, the internal connection of temporal and spatial relations given by Bakhtin, a Russian scientist which is determined by the existing meanings of space and the internal dramaturgy of the event that is introduced into space. This relation between space and time was also researched by the German scholar Schlugel, who spoke about reading the time in space that I also mentioned before for the landscape. Um, Schlugel's remarks are in line with Soja, uh, attempted to, Soja, 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 okay. Um, to avoid the rigid historical and geographical narratives by placing them into a multidimensional perspective. Schlugel claims that events take place and that history happens not only in time, but also in particular spaces. He accepted and developed further a concept of multidimensional world in which space can be read through time and combines it with Soja's hermeneutics of space in order to provide a thorough interpretation of space. For instance, Schlugel's explanation of Benjamin's perspectives towards places in, is interesting. He says that La Bibliothèque Nationale <laughs> in Paris has a triple significance for Benjamin, as a place of inspiration, a place of remembrance, and a place of commemoration. All this is very important that if we um, compare it to the situation in Belgrade, where, where these immaterial values are absolutely non-existent. They, they are not taken into consideration whatsoever uh, if we um, think about these uh, urban mega projects that are uh, very controversial. Um, similarly, why spoke about activities and events in space? The meanings according to which space is open and which is able to receive not only from objects that are in space, but also from activities and processes that take place in space. Although architectural space is built for certain activities, Foucault believes that neither the architects nor the space he designs has the power to fully determine the activities in space. Kulas, I think that I read correctly, claims that people are able to inhabit anything and be happy and miserable anywhere. And architecture has nothing to do with it. So this is an interesting point that might be uh, criticized or not. Some space does not depend exclusively on the space in which the event takes place, but also on the social reality in which the events take place. The various aspects and processes that are in an integral part of an event have the ability to change the space without necessarily changing to a physical, its physical characteristics. Uh, so Christopher Alexander's pattern describes principles of physical design. The focus is less on the structure of buildings and cities and more on the living which goes in them. He comments that those of us who are concerned with buildings tend to forget too easily that all the life and soul of a place, all of our experiences there, depend not simply on the physical environment, but on the pattern of events which we experience there. Okay, now I will mm, speak a little bit about a specific neighborhood uh, in Belgrade, the one that I live in. It's uh, part of the new Belgrade, uh, Blokovi, uh, blocks 44, 45, 70, 78. Um, since I st strongly believe that instead of focusing on, on city centers, we should reconfigure the infrastructure um, of the outskirts. Um, we can see uh, these tendencies of uh, focusing on uh, peripheries and outskirts, that is a growing trend in, in placemaking. Ah, sorry, I forgot to, to explain something. Uh, this is the example from uh, Torino. 
where the abandoned uh, tram uh, station was, um, let's say, re renovated uh, into, so this is actually simple, a similar example to the Ulichna Gallery that I showed you, uh, by a group of activists uh, 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 that decided to put a life in it. And they uh, created a, a public uh, space that can be used uh, for different um, events, for gatherings, um, or, or, or just to have a coffee and uh, simply to, to stay together. There are links uh, about it on YouTube if you want to have a look. So, um, This is a planning and design approach, this uh, uh, idea of um, focusing on the outskirts of the cities um, that works with communities to understand, imagine, and deliver solutions that meet their local needs, rather than relying on the impulses of a grand city plan. After all, most people live their lives, their daily lives, at neighborhoods uh, scale, not the one of the mega city. Policies passed down to support those uh, in the center have uh, no bearing on those at the edge. At the edge. So um, this is the example of um, um, an activity by uh, three activist groups that uh, uh, function in uh, in Blokovi near Sava, Savski Nasip, Zanash K, and uh, Zajednička yeah. Akcija Blok 70. That. Um, uh, by public donations, organized uh, um, rearranging, cl um, cleaning, and the uh, coloring of uh, these uh, uh, benches, let's say, that were, I mean, never, never renovated since the 70s, 80s, when they were constructed, they have never been uh, cleaned or uh, uh, repainted or anything else. So uh, they invited, um, they worked on the participation, they invited the local community uh, to donate money and to uh, work with them on the, on, on the cleaning and on the uh, painting of these, these areas. And they, uh, they, they painted, I think, three, six, uh, maybe seven, eight of these separate, we call them, I don't know how to call them in English. Um, and uh, most of the, let's say, the, the topics of these uh, uh, changes were uh, environment related because in that area, um, people have many uh, dif different problems regarding uh, urban space and living, living in that area. Because first of all, um, green areas are jeopardized by uh, transportation, the traffic, which is forbidden in that, those areas. Um, as I said, since 70s or 80s, that area has never been uh, re reconstructed or re renovated. So um, street lights, uh, stairs, benches uh, are completely destroyed. Uh, I mean, there is some light and there are some benches and some, some stairs, but this is really in a very bad condition. So these uh, activist groups uh, are trying to uh, do everything that they can, which is, um, let's say, not illegal. For instance, the problem with these paintings uh, was uh, that uh, when they asked for the permission from the city government, there was actually no one who was responsible for that. So they asked on, uh, I don't know how many addresses, and they were, uh, uh, transferring the uh, responsibility, saying that they are not responsible for, for that area or that particular uh, thing. So they decided to take things into their own hands and uh, repaint them. And uh, so far, no one, no one said anything against it. Um, but bigger problem in this area is uh, the fact that um, the river bank is completely occupied by illegal, mo mostly illegal uh, floating bo boats. Milana, can you please uh, close the window? Thank you. Um, uh, which are completely, uh, first of all, blocking the view over the river. 
which is a public good. So people who are walking along the, the quay uh, near Sava cannot enjoy and see the river, which actually belongs to them. Um, but they have to pay at least a coffee to sit on one of these uh, floating boats and enjoy the river. Other problems are, uh, of course, an enormous, incredible pollution and uh, garbage that is created uh, near, near these floating boats uh, that is not cleaned by, by them, by the owners. Of course, I'm, I'm speaking about majority of the floating boats, not about e all of them. Um, then they are um, in very uh, innovative and creative ways uh, attached to uh, electric and water supply by uh, some uh, uh, extremely dangerous cables that are all uh, uh, across the, the quay, uh, co covering the quay. The quay. Uh, and the noise pollution, because they are working uh, after the working hours uh, and uh, they, are, they don't have uh, any sound is isolation and the police is not reacting when uh, neighbors are complaining. Um, and yes, the minimum, uh, according to urban plan, the existing urban plan, the minimum uh, space between two uh, floating boats is 15 meters, which uh, cannot be found anywhere along the, the Sava Quay, unfortunately. So here is an interesting uh, um, fact that I, I found uh, the, uh, there is this concept of locus amon, amoenus, in Latin, pleasant place, uh, which is literally topos involving an idealized place of safety or comfort. A locus amo, amoenus, he has three basic elements, trees, grass, and water. So everything that these uh, uh, areas, the inhabitants, inhabitants of these areas have actually, but unfortunately cannot use them and enjoy them because of uh, the problems that I just mentioned. And another interesting uh, fact when we speak about urban planning is that uh, all floating boats across the Belgrade waterfront have been removed so they do not disturb the inhabitants of uh, Belgrade waterfront, and they are moved to other uh, uh, parts of the city where uh, the inhabitants' needs are not that important, obviously. <laughs> and this is the, the, the photo of, of the river Sava, which is 15 meters long, so actually, this is the, the length of the space between two floating boats that is necessary to, to be existing. And this activist group, Zanash K, had this performance uh, showing that in front of actually attached um, floating boats, this is, this is the space that is necessary to, I mean, this is the, the view that we are missing. Um, Roland Barthes analyzes a city as a discourse. The city is a discourse and this discourse is truly a language. The city speaks to its inhabitants. We speak our city, the city where we are, simply by living it, by wandering through it, by looking at it. Certainly, the interaction with its citizens on different levels. Oh, so, sorry, certainly the city is a dynamic entity, no matter how we define it, and it is constantly in the interaction with its citizens on different levels. Urban studies provide interesting tools for reading the city, for understanding its citizens, their needs, events, structures, and its values and meanings in all layers of its anatomy, streets, parks, squares, fortresses, and similar. <clears throat> Barthes confirms this idea by saying that a city or metropolis could be understood only in two modes, by experiencing it or reading it. Schlugel, for his part, explains cities as an open historical or encyclopedia, historical books or encyclopedias of daily lives. The city's squares, facades, and blueprints can be decoded as a text that is rewritten, overwritten, scratched, copied, and again rewritten repeatedly. In his view, a city is like a fabric, an entity of structures in space, the presentation of numerous histories of people, culture, and civilization. Bonadei also compares a city to a script text and explains it as an amalgamation of the natural biomass with human constructions. We might, might say that the city represents an artificial organism within the natural body. Natural spaces have been progressively manipulated by humans 
through art, technology, culture, history, and so on, and urbanized into the shape of the city. Another issue, especially in Belgrade, is the decontextualization of the city. In other words, the existence of misused and perplexed layers in the city structure, referring especially to the organization and implementation of culture and heritage in the public space. The importance of a bottom-up approach, social inclusion in decision-making, and the use of culture is an engine for every city's sustainable development, which we tend to forget. Um, so cities, neighborhoods, and public spaces uh, actually are not given per se, they are socially and culturally constructed because people make places. Um, so if we speak about community uh, and neighbors and uh, citizens that are actually the ones that are uh, creating places, um, we speak about sense of community. For instance, this image, I, I took this image two days ago, it's in Block 7 Desert, where uh, th this man is vacuuming uh, uh, leaves or dust or whatever, and his neighbors are playing chess and drinking coffee, and it looks like that part is literally their private garden, uh, and it, but it's beautiful with flowers, uh, it's very clean because he's vacuuming, um, and it seems that they, they occupy that place, which is public, but they sort of, I mean, these are buildings with 16 floors and I, I think maybe five or six uh, uh, apartments on each floor. Um, and the, this is the example of this sense of community. So what constitutes sense of community has varied across the studies. Um, some scholars argue that membership, mutual influence, fulfillment of needs and shared emotional connection are the four major elements that should be distinguished in sense of community. There are four concepts that receive attention from architects and urban designers, which is act as important uh, aspects of residents feeling that they belong to the place, to a certain community. So uh, that is place attachment. It refers to residents' emotional bonding or ties to their community. And these are the examples that I showed you from, from my neighborhood. Uh, the sense of feeling at home, so for instance, like people on the image, um, is one's uh, community can be expressed in a variety of ways, including community satisfaction, when local residents find their homes and community satisfactory, they are likely to experience a strong community attachment. Sense of connectedness, when residents, uh, inhabitants feel attached to their community, uh, which reminds them of their personal and community history and tradition and familiar environmental uh, specificities. Sense of ownership, when local residents feel they have a sense of control over their community or space, place, like in the image. This sense of ownership, or also uh, the ones that were painting the, uh, the concrete benches in, uh, on the quay uh, along Sava River. Uh, so this sense of ownership can increase community attachment and long-term integration, uh, which leads to long-term social integration into the local area, and such integration creates an emotional bond between residents and their place. So place attachment is a key domain of sense of community, as it expresses ways in which one feels at home and belonging to the community. Decentralizing amenities and developing a neighborhood's personal identity can boost opportunity, um, both opportunity and belong belongingness. This sense of neighborhood neighborhoodness is integral for mental health that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, another point is place identity. It might be defined as personal and public identification with a specific physically bounded community um, with its own character, let's say. Community identity implies that local uh, characteristics of uh, this natural and built environment characterize a physical identity of place, which in turn impacts uh, inhabitants' personal and group identity. So community identity is defined, for instance, by uniqueness or distinctiveness being different from other. Uh, so for instance, people who live in Blokovi uh, identify themselves differently than those living in Mirjevo in, in terms of connection to the place. Continuity, 
physical properties of community maintain a link between residents' past and present environments, which in turn helps preserve their own and community identities. Significance, self-esteem, pride, referring to a positive evaluation of one's, oneself, uh, or a, a certain uh, group or the place which one in that identifies with. Compatibility, which, is, uh, which exists when the environment um, provides to people's everyday lifestyle um, uh, and when they can perform well in that environment, when they feel comfortable. And cohesiveness, the strong character of community is expressed by a sense of homogeneity, int intimacy and com compactness. So through combination of these qualities, community identity can thus contribute to residents' sense of community. The third point is social interaction. It is designed as a formal or informal social opportunity in which residents attend to the quality of their relationships. Social interaction consists of neighborhood, neighborhooding, as I said, interaction with residents living practically next door or in the same area or block. Community participation, interaction about community issues or engagement in community problems and related activities. For instance, gathering in these activity groups as I uh, uh, gave example uh, in, in Blokovi. Social support, so these friendship or neighborhood networks and the development of small groups that foster feeling of caring for each other. Um, so some um, um, activities uh, regarding uh, uh, don donations or sol solidary care about each other or something like that. So, so through such social interactions, residents get to know one another and gain a sense of belonging in that community. Um, so I think that's all. Uh, I have some something else here written, but I don't think that uh, is uh, necessary because I think that uh, I took enough time from you. Um, so. I think that this, this is it. I just wanted to show through several examples how uh, places can be transformed into sort of, uh, as we speak about living rooms, uh, both um, unfortunately in, in some uh, situations when we are forced to, like uh, during the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, but also in uh, situations when um, people uh, either want because that, that is their like, need or wish, or they are forced to because they cannot they cannot afford uh, drinking coffee and staying with their friends and neighbors in uh, cafes or restaurants. So they they create this uh, uh, these these little places uh, where they spend time and stay together. Thank you. Uh, yes, please, do you have some questions? <laughs> Rožica, can we speak in English because Manuel is here? Uh, thank you very much uh, from, from great lecture. Because the new crossing to all scale from micro to macro is very interesting and also focus on public space. So that is the topic of this, uh, of this workshop. Thank you. Th thank you. That's just a comment. <laughs> I ask uh, other participants, Alexandra and Slajana, to comment, especially Alexandra, because Alexandra is my PhD student and the work, uh, actually work uh, and uh, well, Great Waterfront, it, uh, it's her subject. She knows very well, but I think Alexandra now is in the exhibition in the faculty. <laughs> that is the reason why she is not here today. So I don't know. In Slajan, I comment something about topic and other people from, 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 the, from the room. Uh, hi, this is Slajana speaking. Thank you, uh, Professor Bogdanovic, for, um, for the introduction. So, so basically, uh, I'm also a PhD student dealing with public spaces, open spaces, and preserving the ethical you know, greenery and use of the public space. Um, in terms of not urbanizing it in a way to to kind of uh, diminish the function of the public space so this lecture has been really useful and awakening and many great examples have been shown to kind of indicate where our attention should be um, as architects as urban planners as designers 
um, where the attention needs to be on, you know, preserving these areas and making them more comfortable for the general public use. Uh, where there is an option. As, as you said it well during your lecture, um, sometimes these spaces are planned, however, not integrated well within a community, therefore remain as empty spaces or not uh, used enough. And um, I think we all have kind of awakened our inner um, necessity uh, to, to participate in these actions and uh, as a general public, not only as, as professionals dealing with Absolutely. Um, with these issues. Yeah. So thank you very much for great examples. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. Um, anyone uh, from the room um, has anything to add or say, or we can have a uh, coffee and, uh, and the chat. Okay. Coffee time. Thank you, everyone.